Hello everyone, welcome back to Mind Pump. We often talk about how the most important things for your health and fitness goals are to eat well, sleep well, and to train well. But you know, sometimes it's nice to have a little bit of help. And that's where supplements can come in. In this episode, we speak with pro bodybuilder, human movement scientist, and sports nutrition researcher, Eric Trexler. Now, Eric is also with Stronger by Science and an advisor for Joy Mode. In this episode, we talk about supplements that support testosterone, improve sleep, and make sex a lot better. Finally, I want to remind you we have another channel. It's called Mind Pump Clips, where we have short clips from this show. Go over there and subscribe, and enjoy the interview. Eric, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks now, for having now me. Now, for our audience who doesn't, who is, aren't familiar with you and what you do, like, first off, I love your content. I've been reading your stuff for a long time. I think Thank you're you. one of the people in our space that does a great job of disseminating um, applicable data uh, because there's a lot of data and studies around health and fitness, and sometimes we communicate the wrong stuff. You do a very good job of breaking it down. And I can also tell you have a background in exercise by the way you communicate it uh, because you do a good job of that. But why don't you give our audience a little bit of your background for people who don't know? Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll try to do the, the fast version. Uh, started lifting when I was like 12 and I was like, this shit rocks. I want to, I want to do this for a while. Uh, so started lifting at 12, um, was really into it, started training for sports and then just loved the training more than the sports I was training for, which is kind of a common thing in fitness. You, you see a lot of that. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So when I was like 18, the moment my competitive career ended as a, a wrestler football player, I got into strength coaching, uh, did undergrad masters and PhD, uh, in areas that kind of combined exercise and nutrition. So a lot of my research when I was working on my PhD, uh, you name it, you know, citrulline, nitrate, creatine, protein, carb supplements. I mean, a lot of supplement work and a lot of metabolism work. Uh, and so after that, I uh, started working with Stronger by Science with, uh, with Greg Knuckles. Um, and now, you know, I, between Stronger by Science and our monthly research review called Mass and our uh, diet app called Macro Factor, that takes a ton of my time. And then on the side, I, I still like to do some of the supplement stuff. So I, I help out some companies with with formulations. So when you when you started getting into like the research side of things, this, you've already been working out at this point. You've mm -hmm. been in the fitness and health, I guess, space as a, as a consumer. Obviously, you like information. I'm sure you read all the magazines, all the content that you could find. Yeah. How how different was it doing the research versus some of the stuff or how similar was it? to the stuff that you had thought was to be true or learned just through consuming, you know, popular information. Yeah, it was really different. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I remember when I, I got into, you know, taking supplements when I was like 15 or 16 years old, a lot of the workouts I would do straight out of the magazines, like yeah. uh, one of my wrestling coaches, we would train together and, and do a lot of bodybuilding type stuff. Um, and eventually I did compete in bodybuilding as well. Uh, but anyway, yeah, so I, I had these ideas about supplements, what they could do, what they couldn't do. And then the more I got in the lab and started researching them, it helped me really kind of reframe. You know, it, it's not that I kind of started to reject supplements, but I was better able to contextualize them because mm -hmm. it's one thing when you see the magazine ad with Ronnie Coleman <laughs> mm -hmm. and his, you know, his, you know, biceps and veins are just like popping off the off the image and you're just like, Okay, looks like arginine's pretty sick for blood flow. <laughs> you know, when I got it really into works. It, I mean, you know, early two thousands, everyone's taking arginine because Ronnie Coleman's vascularity is like off the charts. And then, then you get into the lab, you start actually measuring like blood flow and, and performance outcomes. You're like, all right, so maybe not arginine, right? So yeah. you get a better idea of contextualizing the utility of supplements, the magnitude of effect, and you know where they make sense and where they don't. Hope you're enjoying the show. How would you like to win MAPS Anabolic? To enter, simply put a thoughtful comment below in the comment section. We're going to read through all the comments in the next 24 hours and choose our favorite one. If yours is chosen, we'll put a notification for you right under your comment. Now be sure to like, subscribe, and turn on notifications so that you can be notified when you win. One more thing, there's only 24 hours left for our October special, MAPS Symmetry and MAPS Strong. To get these before they're gone, click on the link at the top of the description below and enjoy the rest of the show.
so I so I'm I'm a huge uh, I love reading data and studies. I don't have formal education, but it's definitely a passion of mine. He doesn't have a lot of friends either. Yeah, of that. That's, <laughs> that's, all my friends are in this room. Um, but you, but what what I used to find most interesting, or I should say, what I find most interesting now, is taking old, I don't know, strength training, bodybuilding, you you know, strength athlete wisdom, and they explained it wrong but there's value in some of the stuff that they said. Like, for example, you know, um, someone may say, oh, uh, you know, make sure you do preacher curls because it works the lower part of the bicep and then do concentration curls because it works the peak. And so they said, you got to do both because you you want a longer bicep. You know, and then you learn the science. Like, well, you can't really make your bicep longer. and doesn't really work that way. And then you learn, oh, points of tension. There's more tension at the squeeze, more tension at the, at the lower part. So there is value in combining those two exercises. Did you find stuff like that where you're like, did you go through that phase where you're like, all that stuff is stupid. And then like, Oh, wait a minute. They explained it wrong. There may be some value. They just didn't understand where the value came from. Yeah. I think there's definitely, uh, numerous instances of that. And, and there was kind of a, uh, there were multiple shifts in that trajectory. Right. So like when I first started embracing, you know, a really hyper critical look at the research, you start to say, okay, all the really big, strong people from the past who didn't look into the studies, they don't know what they're talking about. We have to go to the research. And then, you know, you kind of make that second shift where you say, oh, it seems like with some things they were off base, but with some things they were actually a little bit ahead of the curve. And the research helps us to kind of cross-reference. Mm. You know, when we have, for example, uh, a lot of conflicting anecdotes from people who are big and strong, the research helps you kind of sort through some of those conflicting anecdotes and say, okay, which which of these different ideas seems to have more credibility when we really stress test it in controlled conditions? So, I mean, you know, I lean on, you know, I, I used to do a lot of coaching, one-on-one -on -one coaching. And of course, I would lean on the research all the time. But, you know, I'd also lean on, you know, what was I doing when I was working toward, you know, trying to become a pro natural bodybuilder? Like I would still lean on stuff that was, I guess you'd say more in the trenches observations. And, you know, I, th I think evidence based practice, even if you look into the journal articles about what that is supposed to mean, it's not ignoring an individual's experience mm. and, and leaning on meta analyses instead it's integrating multiple sources of data, which does include properly contextualized anecdotes, you know? So it, it, it would be a shame to say that unless I have a, a PubMed link for it, I cannot believe it or implement it. <laughs> yeah. uh, you'd be missing out on a lot. Yeah, totally. No, I love that you said that because that's one of my biggest challenges with our space uh, and the fitness space is you either seem to be the, I don't know, for lack of a better term, bro with all the, you know, gym, quote unquote, wisdom and advice, or you're the the data person that is only like, th there's no evidence that this works or the evidence shows this and it ignores the potential for, you know, massive potential for individual variants and all that stuff. Were there any of you, any, did you find any of those frustrations entering into our space? Because this is a very frustrating space, I think, uh, for, for people who really want to do a good job. Yeah, it is frustrating because you, you do see people that, it, it, it is a, a challenging balance to strike between trying to integrate uh, academic and non-academic sources of information. And you see so many people who miss really far in, in either direction, people who have no value for you know the scientific research, people uh, who have absolutely no value for anecdotes. And I my general approach to life is that if someone is just a world-class athlete, whether it's bodybuilding, powerlifting, whatever, I can probably learn something from them mm. that I can't learn from a meta-analysis that's looking at what typically works best for most people in typical situations that have been tested. And I, I think that gets at one of the main limitations of the people who lean too much on just the published research is it ultimately rests on a fundamental uh error in assuming that the knowledge that's currently published is a complete set of knowledge. Right. You know, th there are things that we simply don't know yet. And there are people doing things that, that are currently outpacing the literature in some regard. Eric, do you remember some of your, your greatest epiphanies going through your master's and PhD love? I mean, cause you've been living since 12. So you already have some, some experience there. You start going through the education. 
do you remember like big aha moments where you're like, oh, wow. And then you went and applied it to your own regimen, whether that be nutrition or, or exercise that really made a big shift in your results. Do you remember some of those? If I could be totally honest, I think it might have been that I stopped looking for big aha moments. Uh, <laughs> oh. You know what I mean? Uh, so like, I That's think- great. That's a good point. The more that you get into the literature, you start to embrace more of an incremental approach to knowledge development. You know, so it, a lot of the kind of like gimmicky things in fitness, it's it always takes the form of a paradigm shift where it's mm -hmm. like, forget everything you thought you knew about this topic. <laughs> yeah. And it's yeah. like, right, but should we throw awesome. out like 85 years of incremental knowledge yeah. and just start over <laughs> and assume that all of that was wrong and fake? Like yeah. probably not. So I think the biggest thing with uh, getting into the research was developing a level of patience and an appreciation for incremental changes to one's approaches mm -hmm. versus like looking for that magic mm -hmm. quick fix. The, the one weird trick that the doctors hate you know about, you know, like what, <laughs> whatever the gimmicky thing going. Into I'll buy that. Season. It's like yeah. every ad I've ever uh, Yeah. Read. So I, I think it was more just like the more I got into research and people would say like, you know, like right now, I'm, I'm really into this idea of exercise energy compensation. So the fact that when we really ramp up exercise energy expenditure, we do seem to downregulate other like resting elements totally. of energy expenditure. So I'm really fascinated by that. And, and it's a rapidly evolving area of literature. And people say like, you seem really excited about this. And I say, yeah, I mean, it's moving so fast. We might have some real answers in 10 years, <laughs> you know, and, but, but a lot of people, like before I got into science, I'd say like, yeah, this is moving really fast. I'm hoping to have a breakthrough by the end of the afternoon. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know what I love about that research that you're, I mean, if you don't mind us going into that a little bit, what I love about that research is it's showing a lot of what those of us that worked in gyms observed for years and years and years. Like we would see the person, okay, average person walks into your big gyms, right? So I, I grand open 24 hour fitness gyms for years and I own my own box and or gym, I should say wellness facility. And average person comes and wants to lose weight. I want to lose weight. And the average person who doesn't know any better or should I say who's somewhat ignorant to exercise and diet and stuff, the first thing they do is they say, well, I'm going to go and just burn as many calories as possible. They get on cardio and they do a shit ton of cardio. And I would see this over and over again. They'd come in, they'd lose some weight, plateau real hard, lose motivation, and then leave. And we'd see this over and over again. And, and as trainers, we're like, oh, you got to strength train, like building muscle, such a better long-term approach. But back then there weren't really any studies on strength training, except for like athletes, like, you know, athletic performance. There weren't any on longevity. There weren't any on fat loss. In fact, strength training for shit for a lot of my career in the late Metabolism. 90s was not a fat loss uh, way of working out. But this data is now showing like just trying to manually burn calories. Your body does a pretty damn good job of making up for that. Like is it maybe this evolutionary thing that we have? I mean, it, what is the data showing that you're that you're reading now? Is it is it really as, as remarkable as it seems? So yeah, th this is one of those examples um, where, where like I said, like people in the gyms kind of knew, kind of had a sense for this yeah. before a lot of the research started putting uh, names and numbers on what we're observing, you know, so the magnitude of the effect and kind of naming the effect. Um, but, but yeah, this is one of those instances where the research is coming along that helps us kind of say, oh yeah, so, so that's what was going on. What's really interesting is that uh, you know, this is getting popularized now. There's a great uh, a great researcher over at Duke named Herman Ponser wrote a book called Burn that talks a lot about this stuff. And so it, it does seem that there probably is, uh, we can speculate an evolutionary basis for this because, you know, if you're ramping up energy expenditure to a really high level, who knows, maybe you're hunting, foraging for food, you know, whatever the case may be, uh, there, there is a biological cost of not having a constraint where we kind of keep our totally. total energy expenditure within a workable range. Uh, and, and so what we see is, there is some degree of compensation where, uh, you know, where you ramp up activity level a lot and resting energy expenditure goes down. But what's really fascinating to me is the the way that it's 
very contextual. So going from low energy expenditure to like kind of moderate, we don't see a lot of energy compensation. But when you go from very active to extremely active, we see a, a, a much larger magnitude. And that makes sense, right? Because there would be no evolutionary constraint uh, that would say, oh, we shouldn't go from unusually low energy expenditure to moderate energy expenditure. Yeah, because that's just searching for food and working. Uh, yeah, it's just a, a very typical level of energy expenditure that that you know we should be able to accommodate through you know the means of gathering food. Uh, so it does seem to be biased toward very high activity levels, and then there are also uh, a variety of just kind of. Uh, observations about like who is is having the greatest magnitude of uh, of compensation, right? So, for example, for whatever reason, larger magnitudes of comp compensation seem to be observed in people with higher BMIs, hmm. and it's not entirely clear why that would be the case. Uh, so that that's still kind of a pending question. Um, like I said, people with very high activity level, it's pretty intuitive to see why they would have greater magnitudes of compensation. One of the ones that really I found illuminating was it seems to be influenced by energy status. So if you're in a caloric surplus or neutral, <laughs> like energy balance, or if you're in a caloric deficit. And unsurprisingly, when people are in a caloric deficit, they seem to have a higher magnitude of compensation. Totally. So so they're, they're having even greater reductions in resting energy expenditure as they ramp up activity level. And that, that's extremely intuitive. And to me, that really filled in the gap of, you would see the people who were specifically exercising to lose weight, combining it with a caloric deficit, and, and they're, it just didn't seem like they were getting the bang for their buck. When yeah, it comes they'd to the hit cardio. plateaus. Have you mm -hmm. seen the data on those like biggest losers, the mm -hmm. contestants? Yeah. They'd lose a hundred pounds, and in order to maintain their weight loss, it's like they had to do circuit training and cardio every single day. They're eating like fifteen hundred calories a day. It's like holy cow! Like that's not sustainable, not sustainable yeah. for most people. Yeah, yeah. you know, it, it's really uh, it, it's really interesting that you brought up that cohort because uh, Kevin Hall. He's like the the lead nutrition researcher at the NIH. He's done some incredible modeling work on on energy balance. Uh, he he has forgotten more about energy balance than than I'll ever know. Like mm -hmm. he's he's really top in that area. He was uh, he was kind of the lead person doing some of those biggest loser studies with those actual oh, contestants, wow. and he actually published a paper this past year where he revisited an old publication and he said. You know how we found that their their resting energy expenditure was like way lower than anticipated. It was like kind of an outlier in the research of looking at how much does metabolic rate kind of adapt to weight loss. And he kind of reevaluated the data in light of this energy compensation idea and he said what we were seeing there, that that suppression of resting energy expenditure, it, it wasn't just weight loss. It, it was a combination of adapting to weight loss but also kind of adapting to this extremely high level of activity that was being used to maintain the weight loss. Mm. So so he specifically went back and recontextualized his previous work and said we really should have uh, well, in hindsight's twenty twenty, but as more data came out, it was more clear that this exercise energy compensation was specifically within that cohort uh, a much bigger factor than previously thought. Interesting. You know what I find fascinating is the range of you know, and this is just for the layman, right? The range of calories that your body can burn with the same lean body mass, the same seemingly everything's the same. In other words, uh, you know, we talk about building muscle, boost your metabolism, losing muscle might slow down your metabolism, blah, blah, blah. But there's like a range where it's literally like the signaling that you're sending your body. And this could be, you could maybe see it through hormones, which I want to get to with you because I'd love to talk about <clears throat> testosterone with you because it's a big issue that we're seeing um, and young men especially, but it could be, you could you can maybe see it through hormones. You could th see it maybe through catecholamines, but it's really not completely understood. But there's this weird range of more ver and less efficient with the same kind of person. Yeah. Like like how complex is the metabolism? Why don't we start there? Because I think people talk about the metabolism like it's not the second most complex thing that we know besides the brain, right? Yeah, yeah. The reason I'm I'm smiling is I mentioned that Kevin Hall's done some great modeling work on like energy balance, like basic stuff, calories in, calories out, yeah. right? And yeah, basic. <laughs> yeah, and, and that that's the thing that people will always talk about: calories in, calories out, as if it's like the simplest thing in the world. 
And then I, I dig up one of his papers and I say, if you look at the appendix, there are 64 sub equations that go into the calories in, calories out model uh, with Greek letters that I've never seen in my life. You know, like it, it's complicated stuff. In there. And uh, now people use that to kind of invalidate the basic tenets of right. thermodynamics. And that's an inappropriate uh, way, way to view that. Uh, thermodynamics happen to work out that, you know, physics has a strong track record of being pretty repeatable. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, the factors that influence both sides of that equation, like I said, you, you dig into it and what looks like a, a simple equation, calories in on one side, calories out on the other, it's like 64 equations that I couldn't even try to fight my way through with all the, all the mathematical nomenclature. It's crazy. Are you familiar with the studies they've done on modern hunter gatherers where there was a study done on the Hadza tribe where they measured their metabolic rate and they're like, oh, they kind of burn similar amounts of calories to... John, who sits on his couch in, you know, Nevada all day long. Yeah. I remember when I first read that, I was like, and then of course, evolutionarily speaking, it makes perfect sense. You don't want, yeah. you don't want to be burning 7,000 calories a day when your, your main source of food is what you can hunt and find. Yeah. I mean, it turns out humans are pretty adaptive, uh, which is probably a good thing for us. But uh, yeah, it's very, very complicated. And even stuff that has kind of been pushed to the side uh, and not thought about very much. I, I don't want to overstate this finding. It's more interesting than it is actionable. But when I was working on my PhD, we did a study on brown adipose tissue, oh. which is a kind of a special type of fat cell that has it's, it's really, like the fat burning fat, they would call it. Yeah, right? yeah. It has high density of mitochondria and it's very responsive to uh, cold stress. Mm -hmm. And so we did this study where we would put these uh, these pads on people, like on the main arteries, you know, kind of the main conduit arteries that were kind of superficially accessible. We'd put these pads and run cold water through the pads and just kind of get their, their um, just provide a, a cold stress. And what you want to do to activate brown adipose tissue is... Uh, make individuals cold, but not so cold that they shiver because you don't want to have, if, if you're trying to look at simply the energy cost of that mm -hmm. adipose tissue, you don't want to induce now that's muscle boost activity. That, right? Cause yeah. it's shaking. Yeah. So, um, but, but yeah, so we did this study and it, it was really remarkable to see just the physiological ramification and the direct change in energy expenditure from simply a cold stimulus. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, the, the number of factors that can influence <laughs> influence this stuff is really, uh, really fascinating. And I just want to, I know a lot of people have taken that and run with it and, and said, oh, well, here's a cold yeah. kind of uh, protocol to help you get shredded. And the, the math doesn't really work out on that, but, but, but it is just an instance of the multifaceted, uh, factors that can contribute to expenditure. Yeah. Yeah. And just to kind of put a cherry on that, it's an extremely complex, um, system and identifying one part of that system that has an influence, uh, means probably that other parts of that system will, will move and change and compensate and either negate the effect or amplify the effect, or we don't know. So it's it's almost impossible to break down, you know, the metabolism and be like, oh, it's this one thing, because who knows how that one thing is going to affect almost everything else in that particular system. And we know that they all, it's all connected. It's all on a chain. So, so yeah. since, since we all ag agree on that, and before you move on from this, it, you know, Eric, let, let, and I want to do this for the audience so we don't lose everybody. What are some things that you would caution somebody that is about to to enter into their fitness journey? I'm getting ready to head to the gym first time. I want to make some choices about the way I eat, the way I exercise, based off of what we just talked about and how complicated the metabolism can be. What are some things that you might tell someone before they get started that would caution them? Like, you know, be careful, maybe not do this, maybe not do that when you get started. Yeah, I, I think one of the biggest misconceptions is that uh, complex complex systems require uh, really complex strategies. And fortunately for us, that's not the case. Like if you had to personally manage your blood pressure on a minute by minute basis, <laughs> that'd be pretty complicated, but you don't have to, yeah. like it, it's pretty automatic, right? And, and if there's a perturbation in that system, it becomes pretty, pretty noticeable and then you intervene, right? So I think while metabolism is complex and you know, when I was going through like nutritional biochemistry in school, you'd have these charts that were interrelated pathways of like every major like macronutrient and metabolite and all the processes. And then you look at, you know, Kevin Hall's paper with energy expenditure and it's 64 equations and like, yeah, there's complexity there, but 
when you're just getting into fitness, there's no reason to wrestle with all that complexity and to act as if you have to personally manage totally. each element. You know, right. so when people are first getting into it, this is going to sound excessively like over the top simple. The first thing that if so, if someone that I really cared about was getting into fitness and I wanted to foster their long term success, the first thing I would focus on is how do I get you to fall in love with fitness? Yeah, in whatever way it takes, and it, you know, because there's a lot of different ways to do it. So you hate cardio, you love strength training, we can work with that. You know, you you hate strength training, you love cardio, we can work with that too. You know, like we got to start somewhere, fall in love with it, and then we can kind of hash out the details yeah, from there. Spoken like somebody who's trained people mm -hmm. before, right? Yeah, yeah it's, it's the behaviors that uh, that push success, not necessarily the mechanistic. It's complex in how it works. <laughs> But to get the way to get the body to work the way you want, that's not necessarily complex. I think would be one another way to put it. Um, so let's talk about testosterone because it's not uh, very often I get someone like you that I can talk to. Testosterone now has been observed um, over I don't know the last six six decades maybe more to have to be lowering in men on a relatively consistent basis. This is not a new observation, by the way. This has been observed. Like I said, for the last six decades or so, where doctors and scientists are coming out saying, hey, something weird's going on. Um, testosterone levels seem to be declining. So let's talk about that for a second. What does that decline look like? And do we have any ideas? Because there's lots, lots of spe speculation as to why. And then I'd like to get into how the individual can maybe raise their own testosterone levels and why that's an important thing to do. Yeah, th there does seem to be kind of a population level trend where, where testosterone is kind of steadily decreasing over time. And one of the ways that I try to cling to credibility is if I don't know an answer, I don't give one. <laughs> so, so like if you look into the research on why is this happening, there, there are several plausible mechanisms that have been put forward, uh, plausible explanations, but it is still an area of active debate. And as someone who's not doing original research in that area, I'm more inclined to kind of wait on the sidelines and patiently say, okay, let's let's see how these trends continue and see if we can identify, you know, the exact causative mechanism or mechanisms. Because that's the thing is you put all these mechanisms on the table and it, a lot of times you feel kind of a pressure and it says, you know, pick one. Yeah. Well, there could be multiple, right? So it could be a combination of several things going on. But while I am not eager to be uh, loudly and confidently wrong, I do try to be helpful whenever possible. So when, when people come to me with questions about, Eric, I'm seeing this population level decline, seems to be extending over decades. Uh, what's causing it? I'm not really certain. What can I do about it? Now I actually have some answers. And, and so that's what I try to focus okay, on. Okay, so yeah, that's great. Um, so what does the data show on how a man can effectively raise uh, testosterone or bring their testosterone to you know, levels that optimize things like mental clarity, motivation, strength, fat loss, all the wonderful things that healthy levels of testosterone can bring us. What, what, what does the data show? Yeah. So one easy way to do that is to put exogenous testosterone into your body. That's a, that's a pretty straightforward <laughs> sure. solution, right? But, but a lot of times the question that I get is coming from people who uh, aren't quite ready to take that step for, for a variety of different reasons. They don't want to go that route and they're looking for other things they can do to support kind of natural endogenous production. Um, and, uh, and there are a variety of things you can do. Some of those things are kind of pretty basic uh, habits and behaviors that can facilitate uh, optimal testosterone production. And there are some, uh, some dietary supplement ingredients that can support uh, natural testosterone pr production. So I like to view the supplementation route as supporting rather than boosting, because what you see in a lot of the actual studies there is that if you're putting in an, uh, an ingredient, uh, you know, so like, for example, um, if you have like a zinc deficiency and you correct that, then you can restore, you know, th that could be something that is limiting testosterone production. You can restore that and see a positive effect. If you already have plenty of zinc, it's, it's not probably gonna not going to do anything, right? So that's why I talk about support. But, but you know, before we go into like specific ingredients, basic behavioral stuff, you know, uh, maintaining uh, your body fat level within a particular range seems to be helpful. Do you know what that range is? Is it... So it seems to differ a little bit from person to person, which is always a safe caveat to throw in just about any conversation. Sure. But it's very clear that 
you don't want to be too shredded. Uh, and, and that's, you know, when, when I you know, was doing bodybuilding and, you know, had a, a I spent one one day competing as a pro bodybuilder. Um, but when I was like prepping for bodybuilding shows, like in, if you're going to win your pro card in natural bodybuilding, no one's really that big. So you have to just get absolutely shredded. <laughs> so I know low testosterone intimately because mm -hmm. every time I prep for a bodybuilding show, I, I drop well below the the lower boundary of the clinical range or the, the reference range. You know, I have clinically low testosterone. And so, yeah, that, that's a very common observation. You don't want to be absolutely shredded, but if body fat levels are too high, that also is associated with low testosterone levels. When would you notice the biggest um, symptoms of low testosterone? At what body fat percentage? Because I noticed that for myself after going down, once I get below 8%, I start noticing, and I know this is different from person to person. But yeah, the range, me, isn't the range the 10 to 15? Isn't that kind of like ideal? The like ideal? over 20, you, st you know, I think I've read, you start to see testosterone levels get affected in under eight or so, or under, you know, maybe nine. Um, yeah. You know, for me, uh, you know, it def it's, I remember one time getting my testosterone checked uh, when I was prepping for a show. And, I, you know, I still had a pretty long ways to go to get on stage and, and it was very, very low. And I was like, well, this, this isn't going to be fun. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I mean, for me, it was, you know, right around that eight or nine percent body fat like, level. Yeah. yeah. May, maybe seven, but, um, but yeah, it's it, right around there. It's, it's when you start getting into like the mid to high single digit level, that, that's where a lot of people start to notice testosterone fall off a little bit. And part of that is the fact that you're pushing hard on the diet. So there's the kind of acute low energy availability mm -hmm. of being in a big deficit and training really hard. And then there's the chronic element of just having really low body fat. Yeah, that's such a good point because you probably would see a positive effect. Let's say you were shredded, but then you went on three, four days of feeding really well and like a calorie surplus. We'd probably see an, an increase, I would think, in testosterone, even though you're low, right? Yeah, I mean, definitely the the fact that it just it's not even necessarily getting into a surplus per se, but just not being in that huge deficit. Right. You know, um, that that's definitely a big deal. Um, and, and there's like an analogous situation with um, with. Uh, uh, the menstrual cycle in mm. female athletes, where it's not always the leanest female athletes who lose their menstrual cycle. Uh, at some certain body fat level, it's it's almost a certainty. But also, there are people who aren't quite that shredded yet, but because their their relative energy availability is so low because they're training like crazy and not eating sure. enough enough calories. Body fat aside, you know they 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 might still lose their menstrual cycle. So it's kind of an analogous scenario where uh, if you're really pushing the the deficit super hard and training like crazy, and maybe your diet and program aren't properly calibrated, you might run into issues a little bit earlier in that process. But generally speaking, you know if you if you want to try to hedge your butt your bets with body fat to to facilitate testosterone, usually you know somewhere between ten and twenty percent body fat is common. Now there there are people above twenty twenty percent body fat who have no deleterious impact on their testosterone. That's kind of a a person by person thing. But yeah. but yeah, and that's it's speculated because fat is somewhat estrogen sensitive. So maybe that's causing you know, the, the, the changes in testosterone, but basically, uh, to underline it, it's, you want to be relatively healthy, lean, like right, a, in yeah. a relatively healthy, lean body fat percentage is yeah. where you want to be any, anywhere outside of that. And the odds that you'll negatively affect your testosterone, the further you get away from those ends, the, the, the higher the chances are that you'll negatively affect testosterone. Yeah. Now, what about forms of exercise? Obviously improving your health overall, if you have low testosterone should, cause uh, positive effects to testosterone. But what about specific forms of exercise for testosterone? I'm quite familiar with the effects of strength training on testosterone, and it seems to show done properly kind of across the board and also increasing androgen receptor density, which is another important thing to talk about. Um, is there anything I'm missing or do we see anything else uh, in the exercise literature? Not really. I mean, the, the biggest uh, delineation there is just inactive versus physically active, you know, so, so that's you, the biggest difference. Yeah. It's just, just being generally physically active versus being quite sedentary. That That's where we see the biggest impact of exercise. Um, you know, I, 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 and then on the, on the top end, you know, if, if you are absolutely pushing endurance training really, really far there, there is something called, uh, I'm going to butcher the name because it's not very into, it's not, it doesn't roll off the tongue, mm. but it, I'm going to get 
crushed for this because the guy who came up with the name was my professor in grad school. I think he called it the exercise hypogonadal male condition, or the male exercise hypogonadal condition. Interesting. Some combination of those four words. <laughs> Mix them however you wish. Um, but basically, what, what they observed was male endurance athletes who were just pushing really, really high volumes of exercise, not really recovering effectively. Uh, they, they were noticing reductions in tes- testosterone. So it's kind of that same idea, like with body fat, you want to be, you know, lean ish, but not shredded, mm. uh, with exercise, you want to be quite active, but not into that overreaching overtraining type of range. Okay. Um, yeah. Now what about diet? Obviously being too much of a calorie deficit probably will cause, um, some, some negative effects on testosterone, but what about within, in appropriate diet. So you're not cutting too much. You're eating an appropriate amount of calories. Does the data say anything about the macros, proteins, fats, and carbs, and its effect on testosterone? Yeah. So there, there were two, uh, there were two meta analyses that came out within the last year or two, um, about macros and testosterone. And it was funny because the first one came out and it was, uh, I forget the exact order, but one came out and it said like, if you excessively restrict fat intake, it's bad for your testosterone. Mm. And so everyone who was already dieting that way was like finally vindicated, like, yeah. uh, you know, like, and, and then another meta-analysis from the same research group came out and said, so the, the one of them said, if you excessively restrict carbohydrates, you're screwed. The other one said, if you excessively restrict fat, you're screwed. <laughs> and so the high, the high fat, high carb diet both of them felt vindicated on one end and then really <laughs> pissed off on the other end. But, you know, when we look at the, the literature, like the most important thing is making sure that you have enough calories, like a huge energy deficit is not ideal for testosterone levels. But beyond that, it looks like just having a fairly moderate macronutrient distribution Nothing is, extreme. is the best way to hedge your bets. And the way I normally tell people that is, you know, 20 to 35 ish percent of your calories coming from fat. Those aren't exact numbers, but th- that's more of a, a vibe that's pretty compatible <laughs> with, with the meta analyses. 20 to 35 ish percent of your calories from fat, enough protein to support your, your goal in terms of whatever your, your fitness endeavors are. And then the rest of your calories coming from carbs. And as long as you're eating enough energy, you should be there. Here's a question. So we know that a higher protein diet, um, contributes to more muscle growth and strength. And it's like, I don't know, if we get specific, it's like 0.6 to 0.8 grams per pound of body weight or something along those lines for, uh, you know, a, in, a appropriate weight individual. Can a high protein diet indirectly positively affect testosterone through the muscle building process? In other words, it might not be in a, in a direct effect. Raising my, my protein intake doesn't directly increase my testosterone, but we know building muscle tends to have a positive effect on testosterone. Is that a fair speculation or am I stretching? You know, I'd be a little bit nervous about going there um, and because what you might find in some situations, um, I, I'm not really confident that the the small beneficial effect on like just the sheer amount of muscle that you're building there and facilitating. I haven't seen enough evidence to convince me that that would necessarily lead to a meaningful increase in testosterone. And at the same time, I have seen evidence to suggest that if you're on a low ish calorie diet and you're taking your protein so high that you're displacing fat and carbohydrate, oh, so there you go. then you're getting into those ranges that that the recent meta analyses would start to say, well, you might actually be pushing your protein so high that you're putting your, your fat or your carb. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of a zero sum game in that situation. And you might be pushing those out of optimal range. Interesting. Now, one more thing um, about androgen receptors, because there was a study that I read that compared men and their how they reacted or responded, I should say, to strength training. And they looked at their free testosterone. And then they also looked at androgen receptor density. And androgen receptor density was a greater predictor of how well they would react or how their bodies would adapt to strength training. So for people who don't know what that is, the androgen receptors are what testosterone attaches to, to exert its effects. So what the study basically showed was, well, you know, this guy over here has got lower testosterone, this guy over here, but his androgen receptor density is high. And so, and he's building more muscle because of that. So like, what, what's your take on, on some of that stuff? Cause that was interesting to me to read that. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I think that, um, I mean, ultimately when we talk about hormones, it's not just how much happens to be floating around in your blood, right? It's, it's how much is available in a bioavailable form 
and actually free to interact with its receptor because a hormone that's not interacting with its receptor isn't really doing you much good, right? Um, and, and so like, that's what we see with like insulin resistance. It's not that there's a shortage of insulin. It's that we have an issue with the actual, uh, that the process of the hormone binding to the receptor and then causing the mm. downstream effects. So yeah, I mean, w with testosterone and and for I, that study was probably looking at like hypertrophy outcomes. Yeah. yeah. Um, ultimately, all the testosterone in the world isn't going to be doing you much good if it's not actually interacting with its with its receptors. So that that strikes me as a, a highly plausible observation for sure. Now right. would the same the same rules apply though to improve that I would think as we said earlier the the sleep strength training all this the same rules would still apply though to improve that. Yes. Uh, with androgen receptor density, yes. or is that the genetic thing? You either have it or you don't have it. You know, I'm not really a, I'm not really familiar with many studies. Um, they could be out there, and I haven't seen them looking at like behavioral interventions to increase androgen receptor density. Um, I know there some people push carnitine for that purpose, yeah. but I'm not really on board with that. I'm, I'm a little bit. I'm not really convinced by that. Strength data. training, uh, from what I've read, is the is the most reliable way of increase. I mean, basically, do something that tells your body to build muscle, and it yeah. improves its ability to do so through different mechanisms, which would be that. Yeah, um, I, I, I do imagine any behavioral intervention that would facilitate greater androgen receptor density. It's probably stuff you're already doing if you're trying to build muscle. Build muscle. Yeah. yeah. All right, let's get to the stuff that everybody wants to hear. So I'm sure. glad we 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 basically <laughs> said, look, the the your lifestyle interventions most important when it comes to raising testosterone because everybody wants to know about supplements. Everybody wants to know about herbs and products they could take. And they just, to be clear, they don't compare to lifestyle interventions, right? If you have crappy sleep, poor diet, you're not working out right, you can take all the great supplements in the world. It's not going to help you. However, if you are doing all those things, then there are or are there compounds that the data shows actually makes a significant difference because, you know, a 5% increase in testosterone, like that's statistically insignificant. Like does the data show that there's actual compounds that actually make a difference? Yeah. Yeah. And there, there's a few different kind of categories that I think you can put them in. Uh, so the, the first, the first one that gets the, uh, I would say the broadest acceptance, even among people that are supplement skeptics, is just looking at, you know, are there micronutrients that you might be short on that if you rectified that it would facilitate, you know, better testosterone yeah, production. Yeah, you mentioned zinc earlier. Right. So zinc is one of them. A another one that is, is broadly pretty accepted is magnesium. So magnesium and zinc are, are going to be present in a lot of different supplement formulas that aim to increase testosterone. And th there's pretty good evidence there for zinc and magnesium. Again, if you're correcting a shortcoming. Now, those are relatively, it's somewhat common, right? That people don't get enough zinc and magnesium. I think I read one paper that said something like 60% of people are not consuming as uh, enough or getting enough magnesium. I don't know what the numbers are on zinc. Is is it some is it relatively common for people to not be getting enough of these? It's common enough that that I think, you know, the, the question is, you know, I I don't want to like plant uh, a seed of fear in, sure. in the head of every listener who's thinking, "Oh my god, am I short on like every micronutrient?" but it, it is relatively common uh, or common enough at the population level that it's it's worth looking into. You okay. know, there are plenty of folks who would benefit from increasing their zinc and magnesium in intake. Uh, and for, for some people, it could be a kind of rate limiting factor that is keeping their testosterone a little bit lower than it otherwise would be. Uh, one other micronutrient I'd, I'd mention in that conversation, just in the interest of being uh, thorough, is vitamin D. Hmm. Um, and vitamin D, it's a tricky one because it is correlated, like low vitamin D is correlated with low testosterone. Uh, but so far, the interventions that try to use vitamin D supplementation to boost testosterone, they just don't seem to be panning out the way you would expect. Okay, oh, I'm going to do mm -hmm. I'm going to do something that you probably won't like because you you're a science guy and science people who are really really uh, versed in science hate speculating this way. But I'm going to try and get the, get you to do this. Sure. So I have a theory around that, right? So, in other words, they notice low testosterone is correlated to low vitamin D, or low vitamin D is correlated to low testosterone. And then what they do is they take people and say, oh. Low testosterone, low vitamin D. Let's raise your vitamin D. That should make your testosterone grow up, go up. Not necessarily true. Um, I have a theory. I'd love some speculation. I know you're going to hate doing this, but I know that going out in the sun helps synthesize vitamin D, and that's through the through the process of of converting cholesterol, 
or there's something to do with cholesterol and using cholesterol as a way to synthesize vitamin D and also cholesterol as a base molecule for our hormones. Could it be that people that just don't get enough sun, that low vitamin D is one of the side effects of that, but one of the main, uh, one of the other issues is we're not taking that base cholesterol and converting it into usable hormones like testosterone, hormones like testosterone. Yeah, you know, there's a paper that you would love. Uh, it's it's uh, the the title. I, I don't know it verbatim, but it, it's talking about the link between vitamin D and testosterone, and it says uh, something along the lines of mechanistically dazzling uh, but clinically disappointing. Okay. <laughs> uh, and it's getting at that same thing though, which is okay. that you can draw many plausible mechanisms where you would say this ought to work because yeah. of this reason and that reason and this pathway, that pathway. And the question is, you know, ultimately. Why is there this correlation that we don't seem to be able to very effectively or predictably act upon? And the most intuitive and kind of parsimonious conclusion would be that the correlation isn't quite causative. There's something else Got going it. on, right? And so, yeah, it could be a sunlight thing. Part of me wonders, honestly, if not being exposed to sunlight uh, during the daytime hours also correlates with low physical activity levels. Hmm. Um or perhaps because you're not getting that light exposure, you know, maybe physical activity is something that's in the mix there. Maybe it's sleep because, yeah. uh, you know, really poor sleep is associated with testosterone reductions. Maybe you're not getting out early in the day, getting that sunlight exposure that facilitates good regulation yeah. of your circadian rhythm. It's disrupting your sleep. You have lower sleep quality. You, you could, I mean, we could do a whole other episode just speculating as much as we would. And I'm comfortable with speculating okay, cool. uh, for sure, uh, as long as it's tagged, you know, don't <laughs> take this too seriously. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it could be sunlight. It could be the relationship between sunlight and sleep. It could be just being out and physically active. There could be a lot of things going on there. And another thing that could be playing a role is that I have noticed talking to clinicians that correcting vitamin D deficiency seems to be kind of tough, like kind of unpredictable, where some people need these really big doses of, of supplemental vitamin D and some people, they just need it's a weird. tiny bit. It's very odd. Yeah. 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 We did blood tests and um, it's like some of us supplementing with 10,000. Yeah. I had to a lot touched. to move the needle. Yeah. And so it's really interesting. Yeah. Um, there's another um, uh, element called boron, which I know I've seen in supplements. In fact, boron was one of the very first things that I that I read about as a kid to take for testosterone. I remember reading this in like Flex magazine back yeah. in the day. So we, so it's, it feels like we've known a lot about boron's effect on testosterone. Is that is that one of those ones where if it's low, you're going to have negative just low, low effects, negative effects, I should say, on testosterone. Yeah. So so this brings me to kind of the second category of supplements where I would say there is evidence, but it is evidence that in in some circles will cause some. Uh, some disagreement or, or some some argument where okay. there's, you know, there is evidence there, but people will kind of discuss, you know, how convincing they believe it to be, uh, which is good. It, it's good to have, you know, nice academic debates over those types of things. Uh, so boron, there are studies indicating if, if we really uh, aggressively restrict boron intake, you know, testosterone might go down. And then if we replace that via supplementation, comes back up. There, There is research to indicate that. Uh, there are some studies that have tried to uh, use boron supplementation to increase testosterone where the results haven't been quite as good. Um, but but you can definitely point to peer-reviewed, you know, pretty mm. solid studies that that indicate that boron can increase testosterone and specifically free testosterone. So oh, some so percentage it lowers the sex binding. Globulin, hormone globulin? Yeah, yeah. So some percentage of testosterone is going to be bound to sex hormone binding globulin, and it won't be essentially free to release and interact with its receptor. So, so there's some research uh, with boron showing, okay, it didn't increase total testosterone here, but maybe it increased free testosterone. Mm -hmm. You know, so there is pretty good evidence there, but it's not like unanimous evidence where everyone kind of across the board says, oh, boron is a no-brainer. It. It's one of those ingredients that I would say it is definitely worth a shot when you look at the risk profile and the positive evidence that does exist. Okay. Now, now what about- where would, we, where, where would we get that? Is there anywhere to oh, get that question. naturally or is that we would have to supplement that? Who 
I'm I'm actually not sure of uh, food sources of boron off the top of my head because it, it's one of those things. It's like, you know, it, it's not like, hey, where do I get vitamin C? Like yeah. vitamin C, you hear about it all the time. It's like, hey, have a glass of orange juice. But boron is such like a niche That's micronutrient. Why I, asked, yeah. I, never I think heard. it was like shellfish and or, and organ meats. But maybe Doug can look it up. That and, that and sounds see. right to me. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's uh and it's it's often what does that say there? Oh wow, coffee, milk, apples, dried and cooked beans and potatoes. <laughs> oh, if it's way coffee, off. Coffee, I'm way good. off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And cheeses. Okay, so way off. So Justin's boron intake has got to be through the roof. <laughs> really high. With the, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. You know, I, had, I had no idea. You know, it's funny. So we all did, uh, like we all got hormone panels done or whatever. And Doug had high total testosterone, but his free testosterone was low and they recommended he take boron. Yeah. That was one of the recommendations mm. that they, that, and it actually helped. Yeah. It actually made a difference. Yeah. And you know, I, I think it's important to clarify, like I try to be, when I talk about supplements, just as transparent as humanly possible. That's, so why, like, that's why you're on our show. There's <laughs> enough there where if I really felt like it, I could say, oh, boron, done deal. No one would possibly dispute it. Here's a PubMed link. Yeah. But I, I try to give a really well-rounded assessment of, you know, to what degree is there kind of unanimous consensus across the board cool. among the more academically inclined, especially within that, within the the academics, there, there's kind of a, a particular cohort that's very supplement skeptical, mm -hmm. right? And so they need a high, high level of evidence to kind of win them over. So boron, if, if I had low free testosterone, I would absolutely say there's enough evidence to throw it in the mix. Okay. Appreciate that. All right. Yeah. So let's talk about non- nutrient supplements. In other words, uh, obviously boron, zinc, and magnesium, like these are somewhat essential. Well, zinc, magnesium for sure. I'm not sure if boron's essential, but these are essential nutrients. So if you're low on them, then, then replacing them or, or supplementing can make a big difference. But then there's compounds that you don't, they're not essential, but the data shows that they actually have a positive effect. Uh, ashwagandha is the, is the big one now. That's the one that I've seen some of the best data on, on raising testosterone. And that's the one supplement I've taken where I actually notice a difference. There's very few supplements I'll take where I can notice a difference. Ashwagandha is one where I can, where I can tell what is the data showing on ashwagandha and it's all the same or the types of ashwagandha I've, I've heard about like one that's called like, uh, I don't remember there, there's, there's different types of ashwagandha. And also is it dose dependent? Yeah. Let's go into that for a second. Yeah. I mean, so with ashwagandha, it's kind of interesting because it's one of those supplements where when you start talking about it, people really feel like you're pulling their leg, like you're kind of full of shit. You know? uh. So like, because if you look at like, you you could make a, a solid evidence-based argument that ashwagandha is good for sleep. And, <laughs> and then you can make a solid argument that it's good for testosterone. You know, there are, you know, randomized trials where ashwagandha does lead to statistically and arguably clinically significant increases in testosterone just as a standalone intervention. Uh, there are also, I'd say the strongest evidence for ashwagandha actually pertains to relieving symptoms of anxiety. Yeah, it's an anxiolytic. It's very yeah. So you, you look at someone, and you say, take this. And they say, what does it do? And he said, well, you sleep better, you're less anxious, you're <laughs> testosterone. And they're like, all right, give me a break. Sounds you know? like when you ask people about cannabis. <laughs> right. Yeah, 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 it's yeah, like yeah. snake oil. Um, but, but, you know, hey, I have no problem with, you know, an ingredient that has evidence for multiple outcomes, right. you know, but, but I think, I think just the sheer breadth of outcomes, a lot, it, it does breed a lot of skepticism, but yeah, ashwagandha, there's, there's a paper, um, couple years ago that was like, you know, back in the day, everybody in the test booster world was pushing tribulus. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and there was a, a paper that in the title, it, it just said moving beyond tribulus, yeah. basically like enough. We're, we're done having this conversation back and forth about tribulus. What are the other test boosters that make sense? And it kind of went through a variety of different uh, ingredients and, okay, what, what are the trials here? How, what's the magnitude of increase? Uh, and, and when you take that broader look at if you were to say on the front end, I want to take some kind of herbal ingredient and I want it to increase my testosterone, I think ashwagandha has one of the strongest cases. Yeah. Now, again, that is an area where peop some people, especially more supplement skeptical folks, will dispute that and will argue over the quality of the studies and things like that. And that's fair game. But if you were to say, I, I want to take an herbal ingredient for testosterone, ashwagandha is the one that I would direct people toward for that purpose. Um, and like I said, one of the nice things about it is Let's say, let's say it doesn't increase your testosterone. There might be, you know, 
quote unquote side effects that are actually pretty nice, you know, kind of unintended positive stuff pertaining to anxiety, symptoms, sleep, et cetera. And to answer your question, there is a particular form, KSM 66. That's the one. That, uh, that seems to really be the kind of ideal type of ashwagandha in the clinical trials. In terms of dosing, you know, for each individual outcome, you kind of have to make your own dosing assessment, you know, for what's the necessary dose for anxiety, for sleep, for testosterone. But broadly speaking, you, you see a lot of products dosed in the range of like 400 to 700 milligrams. And that, that seemed to be a, a pretty good, uh, well-rounded dosing range where you'd say that that's, that's probably sufficient without being totally overkill. Yeah, I noticed the benefits at 700 milligrams and I've gone as high as 1200 milligrams and not really that big of a difference between the two. So, yeah. um, you know, what's interesting. So this is a class of herbs that known as adaptogens and adaptogens are, like you said, it sounds like snake oil because when you look at the class of, of herbs and adaptogen, you know, that category, it's like helps your body deal with stress. All right. What does that mean? Boosts immune system, but also modulates immune system if it's overactive, you know, helps with sleep, but also gives you energy. And it's like, okay, what's going on here? But ashwagandha, besides the data, ashwagandha has hundreds, if not thousands of years of anecdote, right? It's it's one of the primary herbal medicines in Ayurvedic medicine. Mm -hmm. am, am I correct? Yes. Yeah, yes. for sure. So you've got a long history of it being, I like, I like looking at stuff like that because you know, the science tends to follow a little later, but we've got, you know, ashwagandha has been used for these things for a long time. You mentioned tribulus. You know why tribulus got so many people confused for so long? Because it can boost libido a little bit. And that's why people thought it raised testosterone. Yeah. But really it raises libido through other mechanisms that aren't necessarily completely clear. Am I hitting the nail on the head? Th that sounds accurate. Yeah, yeah. Th there are a number of herbal ingredients that, uh, you know, th there are some studies saying like subjectively they increase libido a little bit. Uh, what's the mechanism of action? I'm not quite certain. Uh, probably varies from from each one. But yeah, I think I think some people do kind of subjectively say, man, with my libido this high, I must have just testosterone <laughs> yeah. through the roof. And and those are they're, they're related things, but they are separate things. Yeah, but ashwagandha yeah. has been shown to actually raise testosterone. Yeah. Um, what about um, DIM? I know that's the, what is the full name of that compound? Diindolyl methane. Okay. So how does that work? Because from my understanding, it, it changes your, the, the estrogen that your body produces from a more active to a less active version, thus changing the, the ratio of testosterone to estrogen. So whatever testosterone you do have, now becomes, I guess, for lack of a better term, more effective in the body. Am I yeah. explaining it well or, or am I off? Yeah. So when we think about estrogen, I, I think it's, we can think of estrogens as kind of a class, the way that we might think of androgens as a oh, class, okay. you know, so there are different forms of estrogen, you know, kind of subtypes basically, and then different metabolites from there. You know, when, when we think about the full kind of metabolic scope of androgens as a class of hormones and metabolites. Obviously, there's there's a lot of stuff going on over there. And with DIM, there's research to indicate that within certain dosing ranges, it can uh, essentially reduce the activity of aromatase. And so there can be a little bit less conversion of testosterone to estrogen. Got it. Uh, and there's also um, some evidence suggesting that it can shift some of those, it, it can facilitate conversion from some of the more potent forms and metabolites of estrogen to less potent forms. And so you might say that those are th those converted compounds are still under the estrogen umbrella but have less, you know, physiological estrogenic impact, mm. so to speak. The, the way that different, you know, when we talk about different androgen compounds and say, okay, but what's their anabolic profile versus their yeah. androgenic profile? We can think of it similarly to like the estrogenic profile in terms of the the tangible physiological impact. So it's like testosterone versus DHT. One is far more androgenic and than the other. And you right. see that with DMs, one of the other things that I actually felt. Yeah. So I've taken it before. It was marketed as an anti-estrogen. So as a young, you know, person working out and, you know, you're trying to build muscle, you're like more testosterone, less estrogen. This is what you think because you read magazines. This is everything. And it's one of the ones I felt. I actually noticed a difference. It, they've also given it to women to help with um, their hormone profiles, d depending on the, the type of. So this is a well-known compound and the data shows it to be pretty effective at what you just said. Am I correct? Yeah. Yeah. It's it's. Um the thing with research is that, you know, like, like I was saying earlier at, at the beginning of our chat, it's, 
you have to develop a tolerance for time scales that are just irrationally long mm. and extended, right? So you might say, oh yeah, th this supplement, we've known about it for 15 years, but there's like, you know, a couple relevant studies and we're going to have to wait another 15 years to really say, this is irrefutable, conclusive uh -huh. proof of an effect. You know, so I would say DIM, it's another one of those ingredients that there's evidence there. There's evidence that would uh, certainly promote. Oh, that's uh, an earthquake. Well, that's a big earthquake. Yeah. Uh, give it a second. Damn, I haven't uh, felt an earthquake like that in a while. Welcome to California. Rolling one. Yeah. Where are you? It's where still you? going. Look at Justin's yeah, guitar. Still got it. You ever wow, been an earthquake cool. before? No. Wow. That was a big one. We're due for one. That, so. was, that was a, that was a big one. That was a six, I would say. I, I don't still know, rolling. Double, yeah. No, look at Justin's guitar still moving right now. Jeez. Yeah. 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 Anyway. Yeah. yeah. What do they call it? Like the aftershock? Yeah, the aftershock. Yeah. No, it's, we'll get one of those. I think we're done. We're, okay. Okay. Yeah. So with DIM, um, you know, there's definitely evidence there to uh, to support the mechanisms mechanisms that we just talked about, right? So uh, kind of shifting that profile of estrogens and, and, and some of that aromatase activity. Um, but, but it does fall within that category of supplements where, you know, like zinc and magnesium, you're not going to get a lot of pushback if you say correcting those deficiencies is going to have a really positive effect for testosterone. There are other supplements where there's enough evidence to have really defensible optimism and say like, if we're trying to be pragmatic, this makes sense. And there's evidence to support that. But it, 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 we were talking earlier about just the general time scale of research. And it takes decades and decades and decades before you get like unanimous consensus. And especially supplement research, it's so like niche that it just doesn't happen very quickly. You don't get 30 randomized controlled trials just right out, right out of the gates. So with DIM, you know, there's definitely positive evidence there uh, that, that would inspire a great deal of optimism. And it, it's, it's a very defensible supplement to include. And this is where I kind of wear two different hats where when I'm critically reviewing one study, like for, uh, like, like I've, I've reviewed for like peer reviewed journals, supplement work, I'm a pain in the ass mm -hmm. about what claim you can print and say, we now have evidence Got to it. say this conclusively. Good. But when it comes to formulation, if I'm advising a company, I say, well, we need to be pragmatic here because you know the, the evidence is not fully complete yet. But if we have an ingredient where we have a very legitimate mechanism supporting evidence in humans and a very acceptable risk profile, at some point you have to say this this makes sense you know there's enough there to include it and when you're putting together a supplement formula you of course want to you know the first thing is safety is non-negotiable right you need to have good quality evidence in humans even if there's not a unanimous consensus across the board you want to make sure that you're not leaving too many really defensible stones totally unturned good. and there's that balance of you don't want to just throw the everything in the kitchen sink into a formula because it's just a bloated overpriced mess um, but if you go too rigid with it and say no, we're only going to include the one or two things that are just irrefutably proven based on 80 years of research. You're going to be left with a pretty sparse formula that misses out on opportunities, frankly. Yeah, no, I appreciate you saying all that because um, that's why I have you on the show, because I, I uh, if I have someone on with a science background, I'd like I'd, li I'd like that person to have a lot of integrity and communicate things in the way that you are, especially when it comes to supplements, because the supplement space is so filled with crap. Um, it's incredible that it still is unregulated. Not that I'm promoting that I think it should be regulated, but man, when the when the when they you know talk about trying to regulate it, I go, well, I get why you guys are making the case because that is a crazy, ridiculous space. Let's talk about sleep because you mentioned sleep. We didn't talk too much about sleep with testosterone, um, but we know it impacts testosterone. We know poor sleep impacts testosterone. Now we've done episode after episode on some of the natural things uh, or behavior things you could do, like get light sunlight during the day, uh, reduce your exposure to electronic light within a certain period of time before bed, not eating too close to bedtime, um, you know, exercise and health and how it affects sleep. Um, am I missing anything with the kind of behavioral? Stuff? No, I mean, it, it, the, the biggest things, you know, have a reason to be tired at night, <laughs> you know, get out, be active. Um, but you know, don't, it, the, the only other thing I would add there is just kind of, uh, routine, 
So like with, with sleep hygiene, we know like the activity stuff, the light stuff, but the routine can be important too, which is try to give yourself a regular sleep schedule that's repeatable day to day if you can. Uh, and try to have a pre-bed routine that doesn't just involve avoiding bright lights or artificial lights in the blue wavelength spectrum, uh, but also just like trying not to be too cognitively busy. Like mm -hmm. sometimes people will say, oh, I'm going to wind down and get away from my device and then do this like super complicated like brain teaser puzzle. And it's like, well, I don't <laughs> think that's really good for promoting a restful state of mind. Yeah. So uh, yeah, just being repeatable with your schedule and having a wind down routine that isn't just about light avoidance, but is also just about truly getting into a calm, really relaxed state. So when my wife brings up st stressful conversations right before bed, that's terrible. Like the bills for sleep <laughs> is what you're trying to say. <laughs> you have a built-in excuse. You say, in the interest of being compatible with the sleep literature, we're going to have to... Yeah, let's hold later. off on that yeah. until, until tomorrow. All right, so so um, I have you here, so let's talk about supplements for sleep. Mm -hmm. Are there... Th this is murky for me because... I know some things can make you feel drowsier, um, but do they actually improve the quality of your sleep? I know you can knock yourself out with some compounds, but does that necessarily contribute to better outcomes? Like what does the data show on things you can take to, that are non-pharmaceutical um, that can help improve your ability to fall asleep and the quality of your sleep? Yeah, I, I like the way you frame that because if we were just looking at like, hey, what can I take right now that makes sure that I'm still... Uh, still tired in 12 hours, like that's pretty easy, but, but actually facilitating better sleep yeah. uh, is a much more challenging. You have to really thread the needle there. You know, you can't just say, yeah, we're going to hit you with like 10 really strong things and you'll be out for a long time, <laughs> yeah. but then your, your sleep schedule is just completely dysregulated yeah. for days. Right. So, uh, melatonin is one that I think it's really, uh, I think it's really unfortunate that melatonin has this like kind of, it's getting kind of a bad reputation um, among certain kind of sectors of the fitness world. And I think that it comes down to just inappropriate dosing. 100%. I'm so glad you said that. I see kids formulas with melatonin, three milligrams, yeah. two milligrams. I'm like, what is going, this is a huge dose of melatonin, especially for a child, but not let alone an adult. I've read the literature. It's a much smaller dose that's effective for, for sleep quality, right? Yeah. I mean, you can find studies where we're talking about dosing in like the 0 0.1 to 0 0.3 milligram range, where it seems to be pretty effective. Um, but yeah, you, you'll, you'll talk to people who they're like, you know, yeah, I've tried melatonin, but I'm so tired the next morning. It's like, dude, you took 10 milligrams. Yeah. Like, of course you are, you know? So what we want to do is try to facilitate, you know, serotonin is going to change throughout the course of a sleep-wake cycle. Melatonin is going to change. What we want to do is facilitate that without just completely obliterating the entire cyclical rhythm uh, of those, those fluctuations. So, you know, melatonin, I think is a fantastic sleep supplement, but I don't really like to, I, I like to keep it within the range of like, 0 0.1 to like maybe one milligrams on the high Which, end. by the way, is almost impossible to find. So yeah. that's how I use it. I I try to find one milligram or less. Yeah. And if you go and you look for- Do they sell as low as one? I thought like three or five is like the lowest. Bro, I, I found one. one? I, I found one. I could not find uh, less than one. It's yeah. almost impossible to find. Yeah, I can yeah. like I can picture five and 10 all day long, but I, yeah. I can't picture yes. one or three or anything lower now. I, I consume a very cute, very adorable melatonin supplement <laughs> that is formulated for children. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's one milligram and you can only find it in like a pediatric- formula. Like it's that's, hard to find yeah, it's a one gram melatonin. That's wild. And, and I would love to go even lower than that, but I just can't find it at, at the store. So, so melatonin, I think is fantastic as long as you're not just, you know, taking that sledgehammer approach and, and going way overboard with it. Another one that I like is theanine. Love theanine. Yeah. That's one of my favorite supplements to take before bed and with caffeine. What a wonderful combination with caffeine. It gives me the nicest euphoric high. And, you know, I'm, I'm selling it now, but yeah. that's, that's just legit. I've talked about it so many times. The thing that's nice about theanine is that it doesn't really have a direct sedative effect. Like you don't take it and say like, oh man, I'm totally just like drowsy, but it has a very, uh, a very calming and relaxing effect, which is why it pairs well with caffeine. It doesn't have that sedative effect that 
counters the cap. You know, it's it's not making the caffeine less effective, but it does kind of smooth out some of that jitteriness that that sometimes yeah. comes with caffeine. So before bed, it's not theanine is not going to knock you out, but it does help with just like like I said, getting into like a really relaxed state. And of course, there are behavioral things you can do to facilitate that, but theanine helps as well for sure. And that's just an amino acid, right? Yeah, yeah. So theanine uh, found in tea naturally occurring. Um, and yeah, 100, 200 milligrams is usually a really nice dose for that. Now, what about magnesium? We talked about it earlier for testosterone. Yeah. Most of the, or a lot of the supplements I see around there for sleep involve some type of magnesium. Now, the problem that I've gotten from friends and people who've taken magnesium is it just, it's a laxative. Yeah. And uh, it's my understanding they're taking the wrong type of magnesium. So yeah. uh, it, are there differences? Because there's like 50 million different types of magnesium. What's the best one for, for sleep? Yeah, th there's a few different routes you can go with it. There are some magnesium, uh, some types of magnesium that are more likely to cause GI disruption, diarrhea, things like that. Uh, and another factor is that some forms of magnesium don't seem to uh, they don't seem to have the same degree of bioavailability and the same ability to cross the blood brain barrier. Oh, yeah. And so if we're interested in sleep, that that's something that we definitely want to prioritize. So I would say for sleep, there's really two uh, pretty solid options for magnesium. One would be magnesium three and eight, which appears to cross the blood brain barrier quite, quite efficiently. That was created by uh, MIT, right? I don't know who created it, but I'm okay. glad they did. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think I think they I think MIT scientists created it because they wanted to find a form of magnesium that crossed the blood. Is that what's in Mellow? That's the that's the one I've talked about before. Yeah, that was a yeah. that was a, a game changer for me. I didn't realize how deficient I was. I, my sleep was mostly improved just from just from taking magnesium at night every night. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So so that's a good one. Another one that is worthwhile, I think, is magnesium. Uh, uh, basically a magnesium salt salt that's paired with glycine. Yeah. Um, so it, magnesium glycinate. Yeah. Salt, yeah. Okay. Magnesium glycinate. And the reason that, that that might be another good option is because glycine itself as an independent ingredient does seem to help with sleep uh, in certain circumstances as well. So I would say with either of those two forms, you, you'd be in pretty good shape. Okay. Anything else that has been shown uh, promise for sleep quality? Yeah. One that's a little bit... Uh, outside of the norm. It, it's finding its way into the sleep supplement space, but very slowly. And that's actually tart cherry extract. That's in that's anti-inflammatory, right? That's got some anti-inflammatory effects. It is. Yeah. So most of the tart cherry research that, that any of us would have looked at is mostly looking at acute recovery from really intense exercise. You know, they'll do like, hey, let's do some just unbearable downhill running with a bunch of like, just ramp up muscle damage as much as, as, as much as we can and see if tart cherry can help with recovery over the next 72 hours. Um, but, but tart cherry also has a, a compound in it that influences tryptophan metabolism. And, and that's pretty, you know, tryptophan, you know, Everyone knows about it because basically John Madden talked about it during football games on Thanksgiving, yeah, right? Yeah, so so much yeah. tryptophan into turkey makes you tired. <laughs> yeah, enough. and like some some of that evidence was a little bit. Uh, I just said evidence about John Madden talking during a Thanksgiving. <laughs> football game. Yeah, so a lot of people don't know this. John Madden was not a, a clinically trained scientist, uh, so so I don't mean to. Oh crap! I yeah, a lot of people don't know that. <laughs> but no, uh, so some of the the uh, claims about tryptophan were a little over exaggerated, especially you know acting like Turkey is like the only place you find it. Of course, that's yeah. not the case. But but um, but yeah, so there's a compound in tart cherry extract that influences tryptophan metabolism and kind of it, you know, tryptophan in its metabolic pathway kind of reaches a fork in the road where it can go left or go right, you know? And, and if it goes left, it can facilitate production, natural endogenous production of serotonin and melatonin as well. Now, it, it, it's a small impact. It's it's not like going to ramp up your melatonin like crazy, but it facilitates, you know, serotonin and melatonin. Like I said, they should be fluctuating throughout a normal sleep cycle. And you don't just want to say, well, yeah, crank them both to 11 and leave it there for, for 10 hours, right? And so this is a very subtle way to kind of nudge tryptophan instead of going toward uh, a pathway where it creates uh, kinurinine, which isn't really doing much for us in terms of sleep, it nudges it toward that other pathway of, of metabolism where it's facilitating serotonin and melatonin Interesting. production. I did yeah. not know that about tart cherry. Tart cherry is one of the most effective anti natural anti-inflammatories I've ever used. Now that you're saying this, I have used it at night and I did get better sleep, but I thought it was because 
of its anti-inflammatory effects. Because if you've ever overtrained, which I'm sure you have, you competed as a natural bodybuilder, so you overtrained a lot. Yeah. Um, it's basically my lifestyle from like the age of 16 to 25. Yeah, it's like when you, when you, when you, you could take any anti-inflammatory and get better sleep when you're overtrained. That's what I thought was going on, which might be part of it, but I had no idea. Yeah. It's, it's called procyanidine B2. Okay. Uh, and yeah, it, it's a very, uh, unique compound, uh, that is getting more attention, but very slowly. Like I said, the stuff moves really mm -hmm. slowly. Uh, the first paper I saw really highlighting it was in like 2020 and I, if I would do, you know, you, you kind of twisted my arm to do a little speculation here. One thing I would speculate uh, with a decent level of confidence, I think you're going to see more tart cherry and sleep formulas over the next five or 10 years. Interesting. Oh. Cool. Okay. So um, when we open this and even off air, you talked about your education and your, your kind of coming of age in this education, early 2000s and, and, you know, that was like the era, I like to call that the supplement era of pre-workout pump formulas. That's when they hit the market. You know, before that, you're younger than I am, but that category of supplements didn't exist. So when I was, you know, working out as a teenage boy in early 20s, there was no pre-workout formula. There was Ultimate Orange. That was the only one. That was just like a Cephedra caffeine, you know, the ECA stack or whatever. And then all of a sudden, you have this category of supplements that comes out, Super Pump 250 being one of the biggest ones. And hell yeah. Brilliant <laughs> marketing. They showed a before and after workout. Look at the pump he got. You know, it's because we because of this supplement. We you know filled it full of Arginine and all that other stuff. Um, so it was brilliant, created this whole new category of supplements. But because you came of age in your education during this period of time, it sounds like that was one of the main places you wanted to start studying supplements was pump and blood flow. Am I, am I right? Am I hitting the nail on the head? Yeah. I, I've always been fascinated with the pump. I mean, when I first fell in love with lifting, which like I said, should be the first step for anybody starting a fitness journey. It was when those pump related products were just like the supplement market. Yeah. And I just was, uh, yeah, I just loved the process of experimenting with them. And I, I wish I could go back into, uh, naively just, I used to like switch from super pump 250 to NO explode and say like, I think this might be what I've been missing, you know, like, and it's just like, dude, it, it's not, but, but yeah, I, I was really interested in the physiology behind it. And it was a, a line of research I wanted to follow up on. And so I did some research on pomegranate extract and blood mm. flow, but eventually for my dissertation research, I looked at citrulline and nitrate. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about, well, first off, this is a very interesting um, for a study. This is a very interesting category of study because for us fitness people, the pump is good because it feels good. It can improve athletic performance, but the mechanisms that increase the pump are also very valuable to the medical community, right? Because vasodilation, relaxing the blood capillaries, improving blood flow, lowers blood pressure. It's better for the heart. I'm seeing citrulline, and we'll get to this in a second. I want to talk about citrulline, but I'm seeing citrulline marketed to people for heart health yeah. and for blood pressure. So it went from bodybuilding to, hey, you know, my grandmother takes it because she's got high blood pressure. She takes citrulline a few times a day. So it's, this is like a big field of study that started with like, hey, get a better pump in the gym. And now it's like, oh, and then erectile dysfunction. Huge, right? Uh, yeah. Huge market with erectile dysfunction and pharmaceutical drugs uh, that treat erectile dysfunction. Literally, they work on the pump in, in essence, right? So let's talk about citrulline. Why citrulline and why not arginine? So I always pronounce it arginine. arginine. I have no idea if that's correct. Uh, <laughs> okay. So I'll I'm say in, what you say. I'm you in the precarious <laughs> line of work where almost everything I talk about, I've never heard spoken. I just read it in papers. <laughs> yeah. So I, like, I've just made up my own kind of nomenclature for all this stuff, uh, but or my own like pronunciation guidelines. But so arginine was kind of the first one that, that hit the market. And for good reason, arginine is the direct precursor to nitric oxide. So a lot of the nitric oxide research really kicked off in the late 90s. Uh, and it actually was medical in nature originally. So there was this uh, mystery compound that seemed to be making blood vessels dilate and no one really knew what it was. And then a, a group of scientists did a, a series of studies and said, hey, you know that mystery blood flow thing? 
I think that's actually nitric oxide, which had been known in like environmental and atmospheric research for a very long time. Interesting. They didn't know that it was actually doing anything in the body or occurring in the body. And so in the late 90s, they said, hey, that like weird vasodilating factor that we haven't named yet, it's nitric oxide. And then it was like the Time Magazine molecule of the year mm -hmm. in like 1998. I remember uh, that. Some folks got a Nobel Prize for it. Oh, yeah. I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. I, had the, I actually bought that ma ma magazine. <laughs> yeah. I remember the cover right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So some folks got, got a Nobel Prize for it. Um, but but so arginine was, as far as we knew at that time, there was one pathway for nitric oxide production in the body. And that was your body converts arginine into nitric oxide. So it makes sense. Take arginine. And yeah, so it makes sense. Do the arginine. And, and you use the nitric oxide synthase enzymes to make that conversion happen. Uh, but what we found with arginine supplementation was two things. First, at lower doses, the bioavailability was too poor to really move the needle too much. It just wasn't an effective way. When you're taking arginine orally, it just doesn't seem to improve blood arginine levels to the extent that they would hope. And so then you go, okay, we'll bump up the dose. Well, at higher dosages, it causes GI upset. That's and why Super Pump 250 was also known as Super Dump 250. This is <laughs> yeah. literally what we used to call it in the gym yeah. because that's what would happen. Yeah, and so then you're in this situation where it's like, well, do we underdose it and miss the effect that we're trying to get? Or do we go really heavy with it and say, hey, your, your first exercise exercise of every workout is actually going to take place in the bathroom, you know, like, <laughs> which a lot of people did. Like you, you remember, right? Yeah. Um, and, and so, yeah, so eventually they find, okay, well, if we take citrulline instead of arginine, citrulline is actually a precursor to arginine. So yeah. we're just going one step higher in that chain. So you take citrulline, really great bioavailability. It increases blood arginine levels. And now you have what you need to produce nitric oxide when the time comes. So yeah, that brings me to an import, important point, which is, you know, why not just supplement with nitric oxide itself, right? Yeah. Why deal with all these precursors? And there's a couple reasons. Nitric oxide is a gas, and I just don't think the supplement consumer market is really going to embrace gaseous supplements in a, in a, a wide, Breathe widespread fashion. Just take a hit. <laughs> yeah. It, I don't think people are ready for that. Um, and I, I just, it's not a good route of administration, but also nitric oxide You'll see papers that debate its half-life in the body. So nitric oxide gets produced in the blood and it's there for like maybe a second. And it's gone. And then it's gone. Yeah. And so you, you can't just say, well, even if we had some non-gaseous nitric oxide supplement, the bio, you know, the, it, it, it's just, it just vanishes so quickly. Its half-life is so short. You got to go with a precursor so that you have the precursors there so that when the time comes and the physiological stimuli are present, you have the necessary things to create it mm -hmm. at that moment. Cool. So, so uh, citrulline raises arginine in the blood, arginine in the blood, better than taking arginine. And because of this, we're seeing improved blood flow. Yeah. So, okay, good. So, because uh, I hate it when people take studies and say, oh, it does this, therefore it probably does this. Like, no, no, no. I want to see the end result. So we see supplementing with citrulline does improve blood flow and does have positive effects on things like blood pressure. Do we also see it with erectile dysfunction? Because uh, theoretically, in vasodilation should improve things like erectile dysfunction or the quality of erections. Yeah, I mean, like you said, um, you know, when you compare something like citrulline to something like Viagra, you know, mm. they're they're all working toward enhancing blood flow through mechanisms that are. Uh, not exactly the same, but pointing in the same direction. They're trying to make more nitric oxide or just make the nitric oxide production more effective for vasodilation. Um, and, and so, yeah, there, there are studies showing citrulline does enhance blood flow. And there are uh, studies directly looking at various indices of sexual function or erectile function. Cool. And, and there is human research indicating that citrulline can be helpful. And citrulline's effects on blood flow are a little bit dependent on a few factors. You know, it can be modified by a few factors. Number one is if you have poorer vascular function at baseline, it has a bigger effect on oh, vascular wow. function, which makes sense. Um, and also you can make citrulline a little bit more effective by pairing it with an antioxidant. And the reason for that is if nitric oxide is produced, uh, like I said, it, it's going to go somewhere very quickly, right? It's got that very, very short half-life. The question is, where does it go? One pathway, or, or I guess, yeah, one direction it can go is toward a, a, a place where it can be recycled. It can kind of enter this nitrate, nitrite kind of cyclical recycling process, or it can go and form peroxynitrite, which is 
just not what you want. You know, there, there are a number of reasons why you would prefer to not have nitric oxide immediately convert to peroxynitrite. And one thing that uh, kind of nudges nitric oxide after it's produced the other direction is having uh, an abundance of antioxidants present. So, so like vitamin C. Exactly. Vitamin C, very simple, effective antioxidant that can make, you know, you'll also see glutathione being used with citrulline. But what you're trying to do is make sure there are antioxidants present. So, you know, citrulline will increase arginine, increase nitric oxide, but then what? We want to try to nudge that nitric oxide into ways where we can recycle it and kind of reuse it rather than have it just create peroxynitrite and waste it. Awesome. Now, earlier you mentioned nitrate. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about this because I'm not super familiar with this compound. Yeah. Aside from, I read like two articles that said that this is like the be all end all way to boost nitric oxide in the blood in comparison to everything else that we've that are, that's natural that we've seen. That's what the promise was. What does the data say? I'm a big nitrate guy. I, I think if uh, if you made me choose citrulline or nitrate, and my purpose, my my intention was to increase blood flow. I would go with nitrate, actually. The good thing is you don't have to choose because what's really unique about nitrate is it uses a different pathway to create nitric oxide. So you could take it in combination. Absolutely. And have a synergistic effect. Yes. Wow. And so, uh, and, and the combined approaches aren't quite as well studied because it took people a minute to say, hey, why are we, why do we continue to choose? <laughs> like, yeah, let's, yeah. let's do both. So that research is coming uh, and there, there is some. But yeah, so like I said, with with arginine to nitric citrulline to arginine to nitric oxide, you're relying on the nitric oxide synthase enzyme. And just like any other enzymatic reaction, uh, you can basically saturate that and kind of reach a, a, a bottleneck where it's like, okay, the enzyme can only do so much at, at per unit time. But nitrate actually has a non-enzymatic pathway where it goes from nitrate to nitrite to nitric oxide. So it's very direct. So it, it's, it's more direct. It's not dependent on that enzyme system. So you can actually use both of those pathways simultaneously. Uh, so so nitrate is, is absolutely a fantastic way to boost blood flow. Uh, and like I said, if, if I had to pick one, I, I probably would go with nitrate. Where do you find, uh, where do you find this naturally? All over the place. So, so nitrate is uh, pretty ubiquitous when it comes to the stuff that we kind of wish we didn't have to eat. So, like green leafy leafy vegetables have mm -hmm. a ton of nitrate. If you were if you were looking at like uh, you know where would I go for like the most direct dose? Spinach is great. Arugula or rocket is great. Mm. Um, some fruits like pomegranate have some nitrate, but a, a lot of fruits and vegetables tend to be pretty high in nitrate. Interesting. Okay. Now what about um, any herbs that can help? Like we talked about ashwagandha earlier. Does that help? Or is there anything else that, that can, has been shown to help boost blood flow? Yeah. So when, when it comes to, you know, supplements and we're, if we're looking for blood flow for erectile function versus exercise performance. Okay. When you start getting into like herbal ingredients for erectile function or sexual function, then you get into this world of research where there's there's all these like single studies that have never been replicated and you're like that that doesn't look like it makes sense. Yeah. Like that effect is so big and has never been replicated and will never be replicated. So I will say that one of the areas of literature that I find most frustrating to wade through is the herbal ingredients that are intended to increase like testosterone or libido or erectile function. You just get into this entire world of research that's really, it's really tedious to sort through. But there, there's a couple ingredients that come to mind as kind of like being the top of the pack when it comes to a dietary supplement to specifically enhance erectile function and blood flow to the penis. And that would be, uh, one would be yohimbine. Hmm. Yohimbine does have some good research um, in terms of uh, stimulating, uh, you know, more erections, erections that are subjectively rated as, you know, greater firmness. Uh, you know, it, uh, there's a variety of subjective tools that researchers use in these studies to say like, hey, we gave you yohimbine. Did it inc increase, you know, the quality of your erection or your sexual performance? And people with yohimbine often report positive effects in randomized controlled trials. The problem with yohimbine is that for a certain percentage of the population, uh, it does seem to induce some anxiety symptoms. A, isn't it a beta two agonist? Um, I'm not certain of the exact mechanism by, by, I think, I think you're correct. Yeah. yeah. It's a stimulant. Yeah. yeah see, I yeah. don't like, I don't like it for that reason right there. Um, if I take it, I'll take a little bit to work out, but 
if I'm trying to take it for like, like, you know, if I'm going to, you know, you know, have sex with my wife or something like that, I wouldn't take it because that would happen at night and then I'd be up all night. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's very stimulatory. And one of the reasons that I'm not super well versed in the mechanisms is I, my personal approach, like my bias as, as a person who interprets research is I go from effect to mechanism, not the other way around. Right. Because if you start with mechanisms and say, what should this do? Mm. Ooh, you, yeah. you can go a lot of different directions that are fantasy. They will never pan out. Mm -hmm. So I like to say, what does this supplement do before I start digging into why and how? Got it. And Love now, it. In, before I would you know, recommend a supplement, I'm doing that whole process. I'm not just saying, well, it works and I, I don't care why. But in order, I mean, in my line of work with what I do, if I work the other way around, I would, I don't know how I would have time to eat throughout the yeah. day. You'd have to chase so many pathways and mm -hmm. mechanisms. So with, with, with Yohimbi and I looked at the actual outcomes first and I said, okay, I'm seeing this prevalence of anxiety symptoms. I'm seeing some degree of some anxiety episodes that are, are, and just stimulatory effects that are unwanted to the extent that you see, um, people who are, are really reporting, like, I really disliked this mm -hmm. at, in these trials. And I look at it and I say, whatever it's doing and however it's doing it, I, Clearly, this is not a supplement that I'm I'm really really eager about. Yeah. You know, um, now does it work for erectile function? There actually is some pretty good evidence. Is, is the the uh, the um, you know the um, anxiety related side effects? That's not necessarily ubiquitous. It's not like a hundred percent of mm -hmm. users experience that. But you know, my personal bias is someone who's been pretty prone to just being a generally anxious person. I don't need help yeah. be becoming anxious. It's, you know? it's, it's super common in, in quote unquote fat burning pills Yeah, is where you'll mostly see Yohimbi because of the stimulatory, you know, gets you hyped kind of like caffeine type effect. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Yohimbi and based on the research does seem to work for this outcome. But, you know, one of the things I often ask myself is can, can we get a similar effect or a comparable effect with a just a slightly better side effect profile. Uh, and, and for me, the one that, that sticks out there would be uh, red Korean ginseng. Mm. Um, there's not quite as many controlled trials, but they do exist showing uh, improvements in, you know, erection quality, sexual function, things it's like, like the that. King, they call it the king like herb. Like this is like one of the main uh, Chinese medicine um, plants or herbs that has been used for a long time. And right. the number one, it's, it's, you know, it's classified as an adaptogen, but one of its number one uses is libido. Yeah. I know this because my uncle is a, he's a, he does Chinese medicine and, uh, he's at ginseng. Like that's the first thing that they, that they use when it comes to libido for, especially for men. Yeah. And, and there's also research, you know, with ginseng, there's stuff looking just directly at, you know, libido, sexual function, erectile quality, things like that. But there's also research looking at mechanistically, you know, does it actually specifically influence blood flow itself, you know, via nitric oxide related mechanisms? And the answer appears to be yes. Uh, so, so ginseng is a nice well-rounded supplement that's getting at sexual function from a few different uh, a few different directions and kind of having these multifaceted impacts. Now, there are definitely skeptics of ginseng. And so that's why I would say if you're looking into, um, you know, again, like, like we talked about with testosterone, I want to facilitate, you know, erectile function, sexual function using just a combination of lifestyle modification and supplements. I'd say first line of, line of, uh, you know, the first thing you want to address basically is, you know, vascular function is a big deal. And a lot of people treat vascular function as if it's dichotomous. You have acceptable or unacceptable vascular function, but that's not the case. You know, it, it's a, it's a very kind of graded thing where you could go from good vascular function to excellent vascular function. So focusing on things like cardiorespiratory or aerobic fitness level, yeah. those types of things, you know, reducing sedentary time, being more active, mm -hmm. potentially getting to a, a body fat level that's uh, more compatible with cardiometabolic health. Those are kind of first line of, of defense kind of things where you could say, let's do some lifestyle st stuff first. And then of course, when it comes to sexual function, there are stuff, there, there are things outside the realm of physiology that I'm not an expert on, but you're going to want to focus on the health of your relationship, right? Like there, there's like social uh, effects there. There's psychological, you know, some people have like performance anxiety and stuff like that. So there's a whole bunch of other stuff you can address. But then if you're getting into the supplement realm, I'd say the first thing you want to do is blood flow stuff. I, I think it's the most direct thing. It's the stuff that is yeah. least disputed by, by skeptics where it's like, yeah, citrulline, nitrate, and maybe throw in an antioxidant to help out along the way. Those things should be quite effective if you are experiencing, you know, just mild uh, reductions in, in, you know, 
sexual performance, erectile quality, things like that. And you that. said uh, Korean ginseng, right? Because there's other, there's Siberian ginseng, which is right. not ginseng, by the way. I, I learned yeah. this myself. They call it Siberian ginseng, but it's not the same plant whatsoever. There's, right. there's, there's Korean and then there's other stuff. Yeah, it, it's weird. It, like somewhere along the line, people started using ginseng as like kind of a generic herbal term yeah, versus word. like, yeah, <laughs> versus like the actual, like yeah. uh, the actual literal plant that's being used. So yeah, there's like 11, like not 11 like just like a, off the top of my head number. There's a bunch of things that are colloquially called ginseng that mm -hmm. aren't actually ginseng, but red Korean ginseng to me, if you're going to say, Aside from the blood flow stuff, I want to throw in an herbal in an herbal ingredient with human evidence, uh, with a really good side effect profile. That's mm. that's kind of my my number one. Right. Now, Eric, I got a hold of you through Joy Mode, which is a, a company that makes supplements, and we get contacted by supplement companies all the time. And so I do my research and I look at their products and I try to talk to the founder. I have to like the people. I have to like the the compounds, and then I have to like uh, and respect the people that help advise them um, of their formulations. Because, uh, as I said earlier, and I think this is I can say this, and I don't think anybody would dispute this: the supplement industry is just full of garbage. There's so much garbage that's out there. Um, I'm sure you learned this firsthand as a kid, taking every other supplement, trying to make something work, and nothing happened. Um, but I was impressed when they said that you advised. Uh, them or worked with them because I'm familiar with your work. And I said, okay, good. They got somebody who, you know, I, I would trust this person's um, advice and, and, you know, uh, you know what they would recommend. How did you like, why work with, with this company? Because there's so many companies to work with. Why did you choose uh, to work with them or why do you advise with them? Is it, is it, is it, do you know them personally or what's, what's the deal there? No. So, I mean, they, they reached out to me cause I was doing like my, my dissertation research was on blood flow with citrulline and nitrate. Um, I wasn't looking at erectile function. I was looking at, you know, the pump, you know, I was looking at, at muscle blood flow. Um, but nonetheless, uh, there's obvious overlap and parallels. And they said, you know, we're working on this, uh, this formula that is for, you know, sexual performance. Um, and the way they frame it is kind of like a pre-workout for sex. It, you know, they're not saying like, oh, here's like an erectile dysfunction drug. Obviously right. you don't want to make that type of claim in the supplement world, but they're like, yeah, we're working on this thing. It's kind of like a pre-workout for sex, but it's going to utilize blood flow stuff. And we, we start the conversation from there. Uh, I like the general vibe of what they're going for with, with, the lineup of products they're putting together because it's, it's very focused on feeling great. You know, it, it's, it's kind of like a really evidence-based look at male wellness, you know, mm -hmm. um, and not just male, you know, like, you know, if you look at something like a sleep product, obviously that that works across the board, but, but no, we started talking about like, what, what's their, their vision for the company, their direction. And that stuff was important to me. But the thing that really jumped out to me was just being receptive because the first formula they sent my way, I said, this is very good, but could be better. And they were all ears. Oh, cool. And, and then they made changes. So they were know? like, and eh, we'll talk to somebody else. Yeah, because I, I will say like, once you get uh, a PhD, even though I think people overstate how much that really qualifies you to, to do some things, sometimes companies will reach out and they'll say, well, we don't really want your feedback. But <laughs> we just we, want your, your We need your a title. PhD. We want your stamp of approval. For the website. Yeah. yeah. And like, it was very clear to me that that wasn't the case. They said, we want to make these products the mm -hmm. best they can be. And when I said, well, I think they could be better. They said, how? And, and then they made changes. And, and to me, that was the thing that really, I, I said, okay, yeah, let's do this. So I'm only familiar with one of their products. What, what all do they have then? I didn't know they had other things. So yeah, their, their kind of first like flagship product was for sexual performance, uh, which is why they reached out to me um, with my blood flow background. But but then we start talking and, and, and another product that came out pretty early on was a, a testosterone support product. And those go hand in hand, right? Because, you know, we, we talk about all these herbs for libido, but I can tell you from my natural bodybuilding days, good luck with libido when your testosterone's, yeah. you know, 140. You get all the blood flow you want. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, good luck. So uh, th those two are, you know, really complementary kind of approaches. And and I think I'm allowed to say, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm allowed to say they're, they're working on a sleep formula as uh -huh. well. That that should be uh, coming out soon, which I'm I'm pretty pretty stoked about. Um, so so for now that that's the lineup. Very, Very cool. cool. How annoyed mm -hmm. do you get when you see PhDs in our field who are just say crazy shit and are just obviously trying to make a buck? Because you mentioned you know PhD doesn't necessarily qualify you, and I'm sure that's because you've seen 
people in our space are like, I'm a PhD, take this crap. And you're like, oh, come on, man. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know. My, my general philosophy toward life steers me away from getting super annoyed by stuff I can't control. So you're not like our friend Lane Norton who just goes after people <laughs> all over no, the place. I, I would say I'm, I'm completely the opposite of that approach okay. where I, I, what I try to do, uh, if we want to get really philosophical, I'm actually a practicing Buddhist. Okay. Uh, and one of the, the really key philosophies in Buddhism is that the, the point of speaking is to be helpful. You know, so like I, I don't, I, I say, okay, I, I could bring awareness to this by attacking someone and calling them out and getting into the whole big thing. Or I could try to to just put out really helpful information and do my best with that. I notice that I feel better and happier when I focus on being helpful rather than nitpicking everyone's mistakes mm. or exaggerations. So uh, I do, I like, I, and I don't want to just, I think there's, there's value in having people who very vocally call out uh, information that's incorrect and deceiving and things like that. Um, but my approach is I'd, I'd prefer to just put out the best information I can and focus really meticulously on being as helpful as possible. Great. I also think that's a much happier way to live. Yeah. It has to, of course. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, like I said, I, I, I have a. I used to be very prone to anxiety, and those types of confrontations would be the kind kind of thing that they rile you up. And yeah, they, they get a lot of eyes and ears on them. But do I feel good when I'm doing it? No. Do I feel good after? No. Did I really change that many hearts and minds just no. by being upset? No. So if you can just put out alternative information and say, well. I would be happy to talk you through why and how this is more suitable information with some good evidence to back it up. That That's just kind of the approach I take. Excellent. Well, that's like why we that. had you on the show, Eric. I appreciate you coming on, man. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I appreciate much. the invitation. Good time. Thank you. How do I incorporate cardio and not lose muscle? I've seen people do this before where they'll start to lose the sharpness of their muscles or they'll start to lose the sculpt a little bit. And that's disheartening. But if you do it right, then you minimize that muscle loss or that metabolism slowdown. In fact, if you do it right, you can actually speed up your metabolism at the same time that you build stamina and endurance. You just have to be able to kind of program it properly. And the way to program it improperly is just to go do as much cardio as you can for as long as you can. Right.